Stuart Screwdriver, the epitome of racist rock and roll. It started in Blackpool during the 1977 punk rock revolution. We got new faces, we got something new. Now we're all strangers, now we're playing for you. Just cause we look different, and we wear different clothes. Just cause we look different, where we work, we don't. I see the Pistols first gig up in, in the north, uh, Manchester, that's a free trade all, and I thought they were brilliant, really good. Yeah, I was in a band called Tumbling Dice yeah. before that, who used to do all Who numbers, Free, uh, Rolling Stones, Zeppelin, Deep Purple, all that sort of numbers. And then we started doing more punky stuff when I, when I see the Sex Pistols. After appearing on the punk scene, the band was signed to Chiswick Records, an independent label headed by Ted Carroll, formerly the manager of Thin Lizzy. Screwdriver played their debut London gig at the Roxy Club on the 16th of April 1977. Settling in London, it was decided that Screwdriver would play a farewell gig in Blackpool. When the local council found out, the group were banned and the story made front page news. On hearing You're So Dumb, the band's debut single, one councillor remarked that anyone in their right mind wouldn't listen to it. Ian Stewart's reply came later in the form of track eight on the All Screwed Up LP. All the councillors in Blackpool with their boxy Great atmosphere for everybody here. It was just a little thing, it's shit out here. When we used to go to a club every night, getting free and all because of being in band, it was a really good, really good time to be there, you know. Because it was something new, you know. Yeah, of course, it was brilliant, and, and we didn't get any hat, well, not too Tense. much hat on the play. Yeah, a little bit off the taste, but Tense. you know, I used to get on with most of the Teds in the end anyway, especially when we turned skin in. We thought we'd go on great with them. Obviously, when we were punk, we got beat the shit out of them uh, once. <laughs>
Boys were the main focus of the group's disgruntlement when Screwdriver were featured on LWT's Year of Punk program. It's probably Teddy Boys, you know. Uh, he's the one that smashed the gear up in the first place. We're going to dedicate it to the Teddy Boys. We ate them as much as you did, you know. And this one's called Anti Social. driver from breezy Blackpool, attracted to London by the bright lights, streets paved with golden discs, and a recording contract they hadn't bothered to read, they swiftly fell foul of the new enemy of the punks, the Teddy Boys. There's five of them, a four a roadie and a manager S. And they're loading their gear up, and there's about one mic stand left outside and a few drum stands. I look round the corner and there's all these Teddy Boys stood on the corner. And they all came down, he goes, hey, oh, what we got here? We got some fucking punks, you know. So we never said anything, because it's not wise when it's the other. So we, you know, they, they started uh, messing around, and, you know, most teddy boys are pretty soft. So they, none of them would do anything, and they're all going, come on, come on, you know, with all the mates behind them. And if any of us moved forward, they moved. And then finally one of them was brave enough to pick up the mic stand and shove it through the back window, you know, bust the window. So he picked up his, one of his drum stands and this swung around and hit him in the teeth and knocked his teeth out. So we'll interview you in the cafe, but first he kept filming it. We had to do it about five or six times, just all walking up. Then we got in the cafe and he interviewed us. But she was quite okay, Janet Street Boy. She did an interview. And then the following night we played at, at the Vortex. We just did two numbers. We borrowed some other groups of gear and just got on stage. We turned up there probably about ten, half ten at night. And we said, oh, we're just having a filming for London Weekend Television in. Just screwdriver coming on to do two of the numbers. And oh, the crowd all went nuts and that. And, and we come up and in here and had a few drinks. Because all that was going on, all the punks against the Teds at Slum Square. This is for all the punks. Who are fucking out the Teds. And he really stirred it all up with that. Next thing it was on Tilly. It was a backlash from the Teds because the Teds saw it like, yeah. oh, public enemy number one. We played the Bullet a couple of times. That was quite good. It's the first that a lot of skinheads turned up. There was also a couple of the gigs that we played. We played one that was suiting the band Cheese and all of that. That was quite a good gig. We did work two or three gigs at the uh, Roxy and got the house record. Driver turned skinhead and gigged with the likes of Sham 69, who also attracted a skinhead audience. It was then that rivalries began to surface. The thing is, I told you when we first here, right? 
turn up at gigs in baseball boots, put on his Doc Martins and then take them off again after the gig and go back out with his uh, baseball boots on, you know. At the Roxy, the geese has never been a skinhead. You can sing about it, but he's never been one. Things have been going particularly well for Screwdriver. There were regular gigs, they recorded two singles and an album, appeared on television and produced a specially recorded session for John Peel's Radio 1 show. But all this success was about to come to an abrupt end. Trouble at gigs and the music media's dislike of their skinhead image saw them lose out on two major touring slots, lose the backing of Chiswick and found themselves banned from every venue in London. Most of our mates that came to the gigs were political, they were in F or BM. In the end, what happened is the press more or less ordered us to denounce those people in the audience or get bound. Like I said, they did this with us on Champ 69. We refused and Champ 69 said OK, so they got very big and we got banned from everywhere. <laughs> Chiswick told the band to change their image and sent them to a farm in Peterborough to prepare for a new LP. It soon became apparent that both politically and musically, the two parties were pulling in different directions and in the autumn of 78, they eventually went their separate ways. Ian returned north and a year later recorded the built-up Knockdown EP for a small independent label in Manchester. Musically, it was quite a revelation for the former punks. Well, then I heard a guitar play. Manchester and reformed the band for a while. We were split from Chiswick. We did a, a single called Bill Up Not Down on TJM record. Uh, we did a few gigs up in Manchester. Got some good turnouts and, uh, and we sported him over at it. Blackburn, King George's Hall, it's quite a good gig as well. That was fish flat more or less because we, we weren't getting so many gigs, you know. Then I started to learn a Instead of popping up some God, I can't dress And it's all so bad And it's not a mess around with us Now lies is For the next three years, Ian Stewart toyed with the idea of once again reforming Screwdriver. Back and forth to London, he was now getting involved in politics of the racist variety. I saw people attacking Union Jacks, so that put me off the left wing. And then when I moved to London when I was 19, that put me off black. <laughs> Millions of them there. They were so arrogant, they put me off them. Break out! By now, Ian Stewart had become a leading member of the Blackpool branch of the National Front and later joined the British movement. A little disappointed that ENF hadn't rushed to support his idea of a new band called Britain, Ian Stewart concentrated on writing new material. In 
in London, Ian was lodging with Suggs. The two had become good friends when Suggs worked as a roadie for Screwdriver. Suggs, who was now finding fame with Chart Topper's Madness, asked Ian to help out in the making of Take It or Leave It, a film about the group's early days. I was in that take your leave it. I was the only one that wasn't an agency actor in that. The thing is, they had a coon in it, and the, where we were supposed to attack him, the coon happened to get stuck in the same thing as me. So we come charging out and attacking madness from these bug cubicles, about four skinners in each one. I had to come running out of one with a coon. Five years later, the British press thought they'd embarrassed Suggs by producing a front page story linking him with Ian Stewart, who by this time had become a major figure in the right wing movement. Suggs used to be Screwdriver's roadie in early 78. I went back to down to London for a while and I knew Suggs obviously from the first time we'd been down. The second time I went down there, I stayed at his mother's flat because he'd just moved out of his room and bought an house. So he had his spare room at his mother's flat in Warren Street, so I stayed there probably about seven months. You know, that was basically it. The picture was taken in his mother's front room that was on the sun. And uh, the Madness film was filmed about 81, something like that. Anyway, because I didn't have much money at the time, he got me on the film, which he got paid the agency fee 60 quid or something, you know. That's why I was in the film. Since that article in the sun, I mean, I didn't try and contact him and he didn't yeah. try and contact me, which fair enough. I mean, he's going to make a living if he's mixing with nationalists. The Jews are not going to let him make a living, are they? All the things he said in the paper, he didn't want to slag me down. All he said, he hadn't seen me for a certain amount of years, which was true. I've got nothing against the bloke. I mean, he's trying to make a living. And certain people, you've got to play the game if you want to make a living in that way. Mm. I have no intention of like, mm. slagging him off. He did me a favour, so why should I? At one time, he was a nationalist. I think he must own certain views still. Once you start making a good living like that, it's very hard to turn your back on him. In the summer of 82, the comeback was on. Screwdriver were back. Ian Stewart had recruited a whole new London-based lineup. With the backing of East London Skinhead Shop, the last resort, the band had recorded two tracks for the United Skins compilation album and another two for their first single release in three years, titled appropriately, Back With A Bang. The 100 Club set the scene for Screwdriver's return, the whole band appearing dressed in black with red braces and Union Jack patches. Those present were witnessing a whole new phenomenon. Wait, pal, one, two, three, four! I started to watch my country going down the drain. We are all apart now. We are all to blame. The rumours were soon confirmed. Screwdriver were a national front band. Ian Stewart began to make speeches attacking immigration between songs. The whole music establishment was in a state of shock when the National Front formed White Noise Records and produced its first single, the White Power EP. White power, yeah, that's what everybody here believes in. Because everybody's got their own political views, but everybody condemns you for believing in that. But that's what we believe in, and that's the only way you get the message across is through music, which a lot of people listen to. Skinheads loved it, Screwdriver were attracting the biggest crowds at all punk and skinhead concerts in the capital. The National Front were not slow in season on this opportunity. News of the band appeared in all its publications and the NF resurrected its musical wing under the banner Rock Against Communism to organise gigs. The next single was issued to its eager fan base entitled Voice of Britain, which was visually striking and contained a battle cry echoed by an ever-growing army of young nationalists.
Whilst rehearsing for the How The New Dawn LP, the band went through another change of personnel and the change paid dividends with the group producing what has been acclaimed as their greatest nationalist anthem, Free My Land, heard here at one of those early rehearsals. Contract signed and the new lineup in place, Screwdriver entered the studio and laid down 14 tracks that would become the How the New Dawn LP. Well received in Britain, the album helped to launch the racist music scene all over Europe, America, and Australia, showing that the bands could say what they wanted and still get their records released. As with the 70s, trouble was never far away. Anti-racist campaigners were actively trying to remove Ian from the area where he lived, and after a scuffle at King's Cross Railway Station, Ian was arrested. On the 11th of December, 1985, Ian Stewart received a 12-month jail term and was sent to Wormwood Scrubs Prison. We were attacked by a mob of blacks after searchlight had been given out leaflets with my face on it when they addressed me, you know, where I lived. The load we used to get trouble most weekends from all these blacks coming from past our house from the local college. And that particular night we got attacked by about eight or nine of them. We fought back, police arrived, arrested us, and that was it. I mean, the blacks didn't even turn up at court three days in a row, and eventually the police went out and brought them. By this time, the National Front were generating a healthy revenue from the sale of Screwdriver Records and the publication of White Noise magazine. However, the National Front were entering turbulent times with splits emerging by the day. This didn't really affect the now established racist music setup. Although Ian was in jail, the release of the Blood and Honor LP and the support of the new up and coming skinhead bands ensured the music scene remained strong. from prison, Ian Stewart got straight back into the swing of things, playing a string of gigs. He had spent his time in jail writing songs and replying to the hundreds of letters he received from supporters all over the world. It wasn't long before Screwdriver were back in the studio to record what was generally accepted as their best album. The album was called White Rider.
The LP was slick, modern and very professional. A far cry from what most people assume to be their genre. Minus the political content and with irrelevant marketing, it would have no doubt achieved high ratings in the album charts. saw Ian Stewart break away from the NF to form a new independent voice of rock against communism called Blood and Honour. None of the actual National Front leaders at that time did any of the work towards white noise. They left it to the people involved in the bands, but they just pocketed all the money. Now we at the end got a little bit fed up of it because what was meant to be happening, the money made by white noise records, was meant to go to bring out more records and bring more nationalist groups into the actual recording studios and get out material. But in the end, the National Front leaders, which were the two that actually had control, which was Patrick Harrington and Derek Holland, they were using the money more for the political side of things. Strike force, white survival, strike force, yeah. Front tried their best to salvage the situation, but found themselves on a hiding to nothing. Blood and Honour had brought a new buzz to the scene and bore witness to some of its most successful times. Stores in fashionable Carnaby Street were stocking the band's records and t-shirts. Smaller venues were no longer large enough to cope with the ever-increasing turnouts. Ian Stewart found himself being chased for interviews by various national newspapers and TV companies. What times are changing? Feel everywhere I find the reason The time is near Our lives are just a struggle But we're fighting every day And I know it can be easy It's a time Yeah, a time of change Yeah, it's a time of change Stirred against us Are the scum And they are worried Because our time will come and cause Himself a revolutionary Turn out to be a gay Mommy's little rich boy It's a time Yeah, a time to change Yeah, a time to change Across. 
great to be the boss of all he wanted was money And all he wanted was praise But now he is gone and the fans play on The time, the time to change Yeah, time to change Yeah, time to change Yeah, time to change Well, I mean, basically, all we're doing is what the pop magazines do for all the multiracial bands. Only oh. we're doing it for white pride bands, that's all. People that are proud to be white buy our music, buy our magazine. I know for a fact that if we were allowed to absolutely publicise the gig somewhere in Britain unhindered completely, we probably could get five or six thousand people. Mm -hmm. He sat in a room, in a square the color of blood He'd rule the whole world, if there was a way that he could He'd sit and he'd stare, at the minarets on top of the towers For he was the beast, as he hatched his new plans to gain power in the snow Bring the dreams and ideals And the snow fell Freezing the blood in the wheel The bands that are playing under the blood and honor banner at the moment I would say probably five or six of them will probably be in the national charts very regularly if their records were allowed in the shops on Hinder and be allowed to advertise the same way as any other groups would But because this is not a democratic society obviously we're not allowed to On the heels of White Rider, the band were back in the studio. The follow-up album, After the Fire, was a little more raucous and lyrically direct, hitting out at the left wing in particular. who by this time was becoming public enemy number one, was involved in another incident that put him behind bars. After three months of being held on remand, Ian was overjoyed when the judge dismissed the case due to lack of evidence. From jail, Ian continued with various projects, one being a group called The Clansmen, featuring some big name rockabilly musicians. With The Clansmen, it involved a hell of a lot of rockabilly and like, rock and roll fans within the Blood Nonna movement, which is a good thing. Basically, we're just spreading our wings, really. We've got to really appeal to everybody, it's not just going to be a skinhead thing. Ian Stewart was growing tired of the hassle he faced every day in London. In 1989, he packed up and moved north, making his new base in the East Midlands. Look to the future, our law. The storm is coming now, race war. The sky darkens, night falls. The battle's coming now, race calls. Carry on the fight till the day we die. Get the people that will kill us for the flag to fly. We won't surrender, we won't give in We'll fight the fight and we will win now Stand up beside us and we'll have our day Stand up against us, get out of our way The tension's rising, blood grows The banks are bursting, overflow Here it comes now, time to wave, but who 
of my people now. Mass graves, join the battle, join the view, stand up for your race and your nation too. We know the traitors are in our midst, but now they're running like the others did. Stand up beside us. There wasn't very many places to drink where everybody could mix. We got to the stage where they followed me around every pub I went to. The cafe didn't ban me, but the pubs were a bit different because they used to follow me around and I'd only been going in about a week and then they'd pick it the pub. That was happening and eventually it was getting to the stage in London where there was hardly anywhere you could meet and drink, you know what I mean? Plus the fact every time there was a left-wing demonstration, they used to fucking visit my house. Plus I was getting demonstrations outside my house every three to four weeks. So I really got to that stage in the end. Uh, plus the fact the real main reason was I heard from some BMP supporters that had been attacked by IRA supporters on a station. Well, the police turned up, got their phone numbers and details, visited them at their homes, wanting these BMP supporters, obviously, to press charges against the IRA. Now, the police, that sounds funny, that because they yeah. don't usually do that. Now, the police had got it mixed up. They thought they were IRA supporters that had been attacked by BMP supporters. Oh, they got it the wrong way around. They've gone and asked these people and started saying, well, look, we know it was Ian Stewart that attacked you. And these BMP supporters said, no, it wasn't. And they've gone, yeah, but look, we can prove it if you'll go to court and say it was. Now, these BMP supporters obviously told me what had happened, and when the police found out they weren't IRA supporters, they, they went, oh, oh, right, well, tell him this is D.T. Shannon that stitched him up last time he got sent down, and we're going to get him again. So I thought to myself, well, I, this is getting a joke, because a, a queer got stabbed at King's Cross. I had nothing to do with the bleeding stabbing or the fight that, that actually occurred where, where this puffer got stabbed. Yeah, but I was kept like two and a half months in one of these pubs until they just decided they haven't got any evidence. So I thought to myself, well, if this is going to fucking happen every time anything happens in London, and I'm going to get stitched up for things, I'm, I ain't staying here because, you know, I'm not too bothered about commies attacking because they're arseholes, but I mean, once the police start deciding to stitch you up, what a great deal we can do about it. People to the left, people to the right, people in the middle that don't want to fight, traitors by the games to the showdown. People in the middle get locked down. We fight for freedom, we fight to win. The color of our uniforms, the color of our skin. We got the power, we got the pride. When we get the unity, it's Screwdriver was still attracting fanatical support in Europe. Germany in particular was hosting major events. Amidst the volatile atmosphere of tension due to the country's immigration policy, immigrant hostels were attacked, the situation was spiralling out of control, and nationalist backlash was underway. Two days before a screwdriver concert in Cottbus, former Eastern Germany, a communist was stabbed in a street battle that resulted in the band being arrested and thrown in jail. Totally unaware of the situation, Ian Stewart was woken at gunpoint and taken to the local police station. He was later released and the concert went ahead with his band still in jail. The way I see it, they're being made scapegoats for the fact that the German government have brought too many immigrants into the country. Really, if we've had anything to do with the waking German feeling up, I don't think it's anything to do with us in actual fact. It's just the German people rising against the two million. Yes, I wish it. the British people would do the same. On return to the UK, Ian Stewart was bombarded by a press onslaught blaming the group for causing trouble. Ian set about a campaign to free his band and released a mini LP titled Rough Justice, Freedom for the Cottbus Six. Over two months after being arrested, the six were freed on bail, but had to wait another year before the case was thrown out due to lack of evidence. The people shout for justice, justice, and none of your dirty little tricks. Yeah, the people shout for justice, justice, and nothing is freedom but a cup of six. Within four evil walls, accused of a crime, 
But all they done was be in the wrong place at the wrong time Doing all that we can do to free the innocent But our hands are bound by the lying threats and corrupt governments And the people shout for justice, justice But none of your dirty little tricks, justice Shout for justice, justice, and that means freedom for the conversation. To kickstart the UK scene, London Blood and Honour decided to repeat the success of the main event concert held in 1989, where top RAC bands gathered to play a major gig on the outskirts of London. The left wing had claimed that Screwdriver would never play in London again. The concert featuring Screwdriver, No Remorse and Sweden's Derlewanger received a lot of media coverage. Communist groups planned a demonstration and the police were desperate to find out details of where the concert was to be held. You can't these days expect the police to act by the law, which is ridiculous. They're the only people that don't have to act by the law, it seems. So they shouldn't have allowed a left-wing demonstration at the station on the day because it's pretty obvious that they only wanted that demonstration to cause trouble. They must have known they were there to try and cause trouble, so they should have banned it. Because if the NF ever want to march, they think that'll cause trouble, they ban it. So what were the left-wing wanting to do at a demonstration where just a few people were going to turn up in 10s and 11s to go redirected onto another concert to avoid trouble? Yet these people are allowed to join up in like five and six hundreds of absolutely ridden scum. You know, people that are totally anti-British are allowed to meet up together to try and intimidate people and not to go into the concert. We've got the police outside telling us that the gig's off. You know what I mean? We're British people and we're European people here to listen to a concert. Why are them wankers outside telling us we can't have one? When down the road, public enemy are playing, going to kill Whitey. They're allowed to play. You've got the folks down the other side of the road singing, bomb the British people up the IRA. They're allowed to play. So why are the pigs telling us we can't have a thing in our own country? Fuck them. Well, this is for tomorrow belongs to me. A year on from Waterloo, Ian Stewart was feeling the pressure, the like of which he hadn't experienced since his days in London. Angry at the fact that Blood and Honour managed to pull off a major concert like Waterloo, the police and communists stepped up their war on Screwdriver, and when Nottingham Blood and Honour announced they were staging an open-air festival, their enemies set about the plans to stop the show. Ian Stewart was arrested and served with an injunction not to play. The venue was sealed off by police, who also confiscated the equipment. It was the biggest police operation in the area since the miners' strikes in the early 80s. From there, the new dawn onwards, I've made my own path, so I'm going to walk it. I'm not one of these people that change my view from week to week. Screwdriver began recording their last LP, Hail Victory. It was a vast improvement on recent releases and featured certain ironies, such as the song Time to Die. Death was also a subject Ian Stewart had touched on in recent interviews. What do you think they can ever do to stop you then? I'll be in jail, obviously. Someone killed me. What would you see yourself doing in five, ten years' time? I say they've probably been in prison, hell dead, but for the fact of what I am. And they're probably in prison for ten years. It'll soon be time to die. Time to die. On the evening of September the 23rd, 1993, 
Ian Stewart and a few friends were returning home from an evening out in Burton-on-Trent in Staffordshire when their car suddenly spun out of control and ended up in a ditch. Stephen Flint died instantly. Three others received neck and back injuries. At 10.40 the following morning at Queen's Medical Centre, Nottingham, Ian Stewart was pronounced dead. We live in changing times For seven thoughts are now a crime Power flows through an evil pale And freedom's light is growing dim One day is suddenly For supporters of Screwdriver, it was the equivalent to people hearing about the death of JFK. Ian Stewart, cult figure, hero to nationalists, had built a movement and created a truly alternative scene. Now he was gone, leaving a legacy of nationalist rock. The people have stood against us. They seem to be above the law. With the power to listen into private moments in our lives With the power to come kick down your door One day is suddenly I'm forced to take my leave Will you still carry on with the things that we believe? One day is suddenly One thing that I've always got going for me, I've always thought of that, that if you wanted to leave something, music's the best thing you can leave, because it's never going to die, really. It's giving European groups a voice, that's all. It's that believe in the European culture. It's giving the groups that they like a voice, so they can read what their favourite groups are saying, listen to their favourite groups' music. Well, I mean, basically, all we're doing is what the pop magazines do for all the multiracial bands. Only we're doing it for white pride bands, that's all. People that are proud to be white. Buy our music, buy our magazine. I've got a blank on nationalism winning in the end. I mean, it might not be in my lifetime, but one day, well, nationalism is, is succeeding in parts of the world. Yeah. He wants to drag our people through the mud. Well, I don't expect to be still doing it now, no, of course not. No, I'm glad I am. I think if I'd have been doing it, just doing it, playing music like I was when we first got the contract. I don't think I probably would have been doing it now, but the fact is, it, when I've become politically aware, I think that's probably what's kept me going more than the music. I think the fact is that I got so much stick for doing what I did that that made me more determined to right. carry on. I still believe in it, and I always will do. Tributes came in various forms, many from his fellow musicians who idolised him, and the supporters who hung on to his every word.
Taken by the hand of fate You were a friend, a comrade An inspiration to us all I know for sure a million men That heeded to your call To live by your example And take that long hard road Unmatched in dedication And a heart that knew no cold Last time that we shook our hands I saw the fire in your eyes We could have never known right there and then It would be our last goodbye So with heart in mouth and tears in eyes Your obituary I'll write To remember Ian Stewart And to carry on the fight to a comrade and farewell to a friend You did your best You shone above the rest You were a white man till the end Farewell Ian Stewart A man we held so high You will live forever Because heroes Heroes never We look to you to lead the movement and build the scene Your white power songs could never be wrong You were the best band I'd ever seen Through all the years, the laughs and the fears And the friends you made on the way The times in a cell when they gave you hell From the course never did you stray Against the police and the reds and the traitors that fled You stood up and took on the world from the fences and digs to the rallies and gigs So proudly the flag you unfold And we will carry on with the hope in your songs To turn back now would be such a sin And we are ready to toil for the blood and the soil Ian Stewart, you know we will win Shot above the rest, you were a white man till the end. Farewell, Ian Stewart, a man we held so high. You will live forever because heroes, heroes never die. So farewell to a comrade, farewell to a friend. You did your best, you shot above the rest, you were a white man. Farewell, Ian Stewart. 
We'll always be the same, so I hope all the people that listen to the band will always be the same.